Okay, here we go. We have our chairman. Uh, so we all know about vaccines and, and uh, <clears throat> what they've accomplished in the p past, which is rather miraculous. If you think back in the last 30 years, we now have vaccines not only for infectious diseases, but we have vaccines for uh, the, that through infectious disease like uh, hepatitis B and, and uh, uh, human papillomavirus uh, cause cancers. And we have vaccines that prevent cancer. And so that's sensational. On the other hand, one of the scourges of our generation and uh, a huge problem still is HIV disease. And people have been trying to make a vaccine to that for years and, and uh, without success, but not without trying. The trials, people have tried very, very hard, huge efforts uh, and, and continue in that. And we're going to get brought, brought up on all of these things because we're going to hear about new innovations and a wave of innovations in, in uh, vaccine work, which is very exciting. Uh, Julie Gerberding is going to chair this session. Uh, Julie is, is a real infectious disease guru. She's been in the field a long time. She was head of the CDC, as many of you will recall. She's an, she's an MD, of course, but she has a special expertise in, in uh, infectious diseases. And uh, she's currently executive vice president at Merck, and her title, chief patient, patient officer. <laughs> And, and uh, she and I are discussing what this might mean, <laughs> <laughs> Try, trying to figure it out. And, uh, but she's also head of communications and, and uh, communicate, uh, and, and uh, oh, oh, she has many things reporting to her. But she, so she's a very important person. And, and uh, she's, she's uh, now going to uh, lead this discussion in a field which is really crucial, if you think the impact that vaccines have had in the past and, and the things that they're struggling with today. So I really look forward to hearing about this wave of new innovations. Uh, Julie, take over. Thank you, Dr. Vagelos, and thank you so much for uh, including this session and for including me as the chair. Before I introduce you to the panelists, um, I thought I would just do a little bit of a scene setting. If you tuned into the news today and asked for kind of a global situation report of where we are in the world of, of infectious disease, you might be surprised about what's going on in the world. Um, for example, there have been 1,200 cases of plague in Madagascar since August, 124 deaths, and that outbreak is still ongoing. Um, started in a rural area, probably from a rat or a flea in some isolated situation, but now it is involving uh, 40 out of the 114 districts in Madagascar and 10 of the largest cities in Madagascar. You might also learn that the avian influenza H9N7 is, excuse me, H7 and 9, is um, still propagating in Asia in the fifth wave of this outbreak, um, affecting now more than 1,600 humans, about 700 in China, a mortality rate um, of about 200 people so far. And that outbreak is interesting from the standpoint that the virus itself is evolving. Started out as what we would call low path, meaning it's present in chicken flocks but not killing too many chickens, and now has slowly become more and more lethal so that it's killing chicken flocks and in a ferret model at least, is capable of airborne transmission and a high degree of fatality in that model of influenza. Finally, you might um, hear about the Marburg in infection outbreak, a hemorrhagic fever like Ebola virus um, that's going on in eastern Uganda. There are at least um, two very um, uh, two deaths and probably a total of five cases in that outbreak. Um, started most likely from a man who visited a cave full of fruit bats that are known to harbor Marburg and then spread to family members who took care of him when he is sick and probably also to healthcare workers um, who were involved with body fluids. So I bring these three situations up because in a sense they're really emblematic about what we need to talk about on this panel. First of all, they're zoonotic diseases. They're infections that start in animals and then spill over into human beings and can cause high rates of mortality and under certain circumstances a fair amount of person-to-person -person spread. 
Now, we're living in a world where this emergence and spillover has probably never been more likely. It's not just about urbanization or the changes in the demography around the world. It has to do with an unprecedented societal dislocation. There are 65 million refugees in the world, people who are moving around in unstable living conditions, being exposed to all kinds of infectious diseases. Air transportation has never been more ubiquitous. And we're seeing um, in all of these cases, uh, basically here in the United States, we're just one traveler away from being exposed to these or other emerging infections. So the pandemic threat is here. Uh, we've had a lot of close calls in the last decade with SARS and avian influenza and MERS, um, e Ebola in West Africa, and yet um, so far we haven't had to contend with uh, a large-scale pandemic of an acute nature, but I think Mark could tell us a little bit more about the pandemic that we are experiencing, the pandemic of HIV, and what we can learn. And of course, if you're a chicken, we do have an avian influenza pandemic. So um, it's all relative. What we're really saying here is that the pandemic potential is the problem. And I think this panel is the solution. And now I'd like to introduce my, my panelists, um, because I think you'll agree there's just an incredibly erudite group of people who have a broad spectrum of experiences that are relevant to these opportunities for new innovations in this area. So sitting next to me is Dr. Richard Hackett, who's the CEO of something called CEPI, which stands for the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiative, which is a new private-public partnership to really tackle the market failures that are preventing us from having vaccines in time to solve these emerging infectious diseases. But Richard was formerly the chief medical officer in the Department of Health and Human Services responsible for BARDA, which is basically the nation's biodefense um, countermeasure initiative. Richard also spent time at NIAID in uh, radiation countermeasures. Countermeasures, thank you, and has a long uh, tradition of contribution both at the policy level as well as the scientific level in the world of biodefense. Next to Richard is M Mark Feinberg, who is currently the CEO of IAVI, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. Mark was formerly with Merck Vaccines as the Chief Public Health and Science Officer, but he too has a long tradition of engagement in, in bench science. The first PhD student in the United States to write a thesis on HIV um, back in the day, and, and I first knew Mark when he was an investigator at UCSF and, and the Gladstone Foundation doing very basic immunology related to AIDS. But Mark also has had a time in government, um, a time uh, as a policy leader, and now is working right smack in the middle of private-public partnerships through IAVI. Uh, next to Mark is Rajiv Venkaya. Dr. Venkaya is the president of Takeda Vaccines. Rajiv has a, a, a resume that similarly um, includes a great deal of private public service um, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he was responsible for vaccine delivery and sat on the board of Gavi. But also Rajiv uh, was in the White House, um, really front and center in terms of our nation's pandemic preparedness and other biodefense strategy um, execution at an administrative level. Um, and of course, Rajiv also was well trained at UCSF in San Francisco General, where I was once probably his professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and probably. last but certainly not least is Dr. Steve Whitehead, who is a senior associate investigator at NIAID. And Steve has really dedicated his career to vaccines. And if there's anyone at the table who can comment on innovations in this space, it, it Steve. He first started with sensitial viruses and participated in their tech transfer, which we'll ask him a few questions about. But Steve also um, has um, had frontline experience with Ebola and can tell us a little bit about the realities of development and delivery of vaccines under those circumstances. So without further ado, I'll, I'll kick it off with a couple of questions to our panelists, but we do want to leave plenty of time for audience um, Q&A, so we'll keep our answers brief and hopefully to the point. 
So I'd, I'd like to start with the discovery side of things, if we go discovery, development, and delivery, um, because um, we obviously still have challenges in the discovery domain. And Steve, you've been thinking a lot about the agenda for vaccine research and how we can do a better job of anticipating and preparing for these emerging problems. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the priority research agenda and how you're approaching it in your role at NIAID? Sure. Uh, I mean, everybody asks what's next. And that's the big uh, question. And how do we um, set aside resources to work on what's next? What's the next big thing? And so in NAID, we have uh, three different programs or three different focuses that we use to um, uh, uh, do initial research on these pathogens. And one of them is probably the biggest gamble, and that is pathogen-specific research. So I'm going to study plague because I think that's going to be the next pathogen. You know, you go to the roulette wheel and you spin it. You, you try to find out what, what you think will be the next pathogen. It requires a crystal ball, but there are lists, and there's lots of different lists out there that have priority pathogens, whether it's a WHO list, whether it's a CEPI list, whether it's a CDC select agent list. There are pathogens that are being watched very carefully. They should be watched very carefully. But I want to remind people that HIV, um, SARS, Zika were not on any of these kinds of lists. Ebola was. But we, it, it's a gamble. So we try to make our best guess, our best judgment, based on probably underfunded surveillance and underfunded epidemiological studies to try to predict what this is. That's, that is the pathogen-specific research pathway. Another pathway is more um, pathogen agnostic, and that is developing platforms for vaccines that can be used for any pathogen, or for most pathogens, or for a group of pathogens. Uh, these are vector approaches. These are DNA approaches. These have um, VLPs, nanoparticles, RNA, these, these new innovative approaches that we can just swap in the antigen of our choice. These have been uh, successful uh, in, in some regard. Uh, the Vaccine Research Center at NIAID has used uh, a DNA approach that started uh, early on in Ebola. So from the beginning of the research to the first phase one clinical trial for Ebola was 17 months. Okay? Then Zika came along, and Tony Fauci always likes to say, we did that in three months. We had the Zika sequence, and in three months, we were into a clinical trial. Now, I have to qualify that. They had a little bit of a head start because they were thinking about Zika, because they were starting to see some Zika incidents in tropical areas. So those are the, the platform-based uh, technology approaches. The other approach is uh, what I call a prototype pathogen approach. So I work on a laboratory may work on hemorrhagic viruses and you know, do basic research on the structure and um, uh, uh, the particle structures, the epitope structures for these types of viruses. Hemorrhagic viruses are always on everybody's lists. We, my laboratory used this approach for um, uh, flaviviruses, for the mosquito-borne viruses, such as dengue, um, West Nile virus, and it you know, segued into Zika virus. We knew a lot about how the flavy viruses behave and what we, what we can and cannot do uh, with these viruses. So Mark, there are so many pathogens and so little time and so little money. Um, when we think about that list and that prioritization, you know, what are some of the factors that are most important in considering where to go with our investment. I'm asking you because I know that you chair the scientific advisory group of CEPI and you're having to make those decisions as you look at candidates and applications for funding. What, 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 what do you, you use as the criteria? Well, I mean, similarly to what Steve mentioned, um, you know, you want to 
both identify risks for known pathogens. So, you know, we can name infections, whether it's Ebola or Zika or, or plague and, or flu. And, you know, clearly some of those are going to have major potential for, for global spread. And those are obviously concerning ones and would need to be prioritized. But the one that I think we would all agree is, is the biggest risk, but I don't think, you know, the global health community or governments overall pay enough attention to is the currently unknown pathogen that's going to arise and um, spread quickly. So, you know, everyone is familiar with the SARS outbreak and, and just how disruptive that was. If SARS had just been a little bit more um, infectious or, you know, readily transmitted, um, it would have been a real disaster. And I think all of us have seen the various movies, whether it's, you know, silly ones like Outbreak or a more serious one like Contagion, where there's this emerging infectious disease that's truly threatening the globe. So um, when you think about priorities, you need to think about how to sort of <laughs> prepare for the ones we know, even if they haven't yet spread widely. I think Ebola surprised everybody and changed the conversation because there was a long period of time when people didn't think that we would need an Ebola vaccine or that if you had one that you would be able to test it. I think the Ebola outbreak of 2014 changed that, but it also really highlighted to people that the models we have for developing vaccines and the opportunities for public-private partnerships to drive progress in developing vaccines um, really needs to be reimagined um, and made much more effective. So in thinking about the prioritization, you know, I think for CEPI as well as for me personally, um, you know, thinking about what are the pathogens that we know are out there that we desperately need vaccines for, even if they are potential threats rather than current day threats, because things will surprise us. Secondly, how do we prepare not only scientifically, but as a broader global health community? And I include the private sector in that in a major way, because whatever happens, the pharmaceutical companies who develop vaccines are on the critical path to actually getting a vaccine and making it available. And the third thing that I need, think needs prioritization is we need new models for figuring out how to do this work. And we also need to sort of think about how to do it in, in peacetime. You can't respond to a crisis. You need to prepare for it. And as we've seen again and again, whether it's with Ebola or Zika or, you know, for me, most importantly for HIV, when it's not in the headlines, people forget about it and mobilizing efforts to get stuff done just sort of disappears. And um, we, I think all of those are priorities. It's not just the science, it's the preparedness, and it's the partnerships that are essential to get right. You know, and I mentioned at the beginning, plague, uh, avian influenza, and Marburg, those are three diseases for which we actually do have candidate vaccines at least, but people aren't protected. So Richard, um, in your new role, it's really your job to try to figure out how to bring these candidates across the valley of death into an environment where they're actually not just available, but we have information about their potential efficacy and at least a plan for how we might be able to use them. So I'm sure the audience would like to hear a little bit more about CEPI, um, what your goals are, and how CEPI can really help this valley of death problem. Sure, sure. Can everybody hear me? Um, so I, I think I'm here to endorse what your proposition at the beginning, that epidemics and, and pandemics truly represent a threat to global security. And I would say that CEPI as an organization is dedicated to the proposition that we can do something about it. Um, I think there are converging factors that, that position us to be able to do something about it. There, there are certainly advances in vaccine science and vaccinology, new, new platforms such as some of the ones that Steve mentioned that uh, present the opportunity to develop vaccines much more rapidly if we were to face a new pathogen. And as, as Mark was saying, we can anticipate pathogens that we need to be prepared for. Ebola did surprise us, but I think there's an important lesson in, in the surprise, which is that a pathogen that we thought we understood and that we had had dozens of, of outbreaks to practice containment and that we thought that normal public health interventions could 
fairly routinely bring under control once they were brought to bear on the disease, move that disease into a new environment, into a new social context, into a context that's been disrupted by conflict, uh, where the public health system and medical care systems have been decimated, and suddenly that disease can behave in a very different and much more explosive way. So WHO, in prioritizing pathogens that we know about that we don't have countermeasures for, um, you know, gave us a head start. When we, when we undertook our prioritization process, we, we looked at it essentially through two dimensions. The impact if, if the viruses, they're all viruses actually on the list, interestingly, plague is not on the list. Maybe Yet. we should reconsider that. <laughs> um, but um, they were all viruses, and what would be the impact if, they, um, if large epidemics occurred? And the other factor that we looked at was what do we understand about the induction of immunity against these diseases? What do we understand about natural immunity? What do we understand about the vaccine pipeline for these products? And so we, in our prioritization, tried to look at the viruses with the greatest impact and those for which we had a reasonable likelihood of developing vaccines, or, or we estimated that we had a reasonable likelihood of developing vaccines. CEPI really grew out of the Ebola epidemic uh, and the you know, the sad fact that there had been significant investment in Ebola vaccines, Ebola therapeutics, and Ebola diagnostics for more than a decade because Ebola was perceived to be a biodefense threat. And yet, in the, in the course of this epidemic, which became the largest Ebola <coughs> epidemic ever, more than 28,000 cases, more than 11,000 deaths, it took it about a year to mobilize these products into clinical trials and into field trials. And at the end of the day, after 28,000 deaths, we only had two studies, one for a therapeutic and one for a vaccine, that generated any usable data about efficacy. And that's just absolutely unacceptable. So CEPI, as an organization, was established, one, to move vaccines forward, to conduct the clinical trials for threats that we can perceive and, and to develop platforms that we hope we can mobilize for threats that we don't know about right now. But not only to, to just fund the R&D and to advance the products through a regulatory you know, uh, process, but also to work with countries at risk. We know what countries are at risk for Lhasa. We know what countries are at risk for NEPA. We know what countries are at risk for MERS, which are the diseases that we've prioritized. And we can work with clinical scientists and with national regulatory authorities in those countries help them design clinical trials for the scenarios that we can predict, whether we're using the vaccine for general you know, populations, prophylaxis, or we're using it in a response mode, design those clinical trials, have those clinical trials reviewed in advance, and have the vaccines ready and waiting. And, and if an epidemic occurs and, and expands rapidly, like the, epi the, the plague epidemic has expanded rapidly, doubling every 12 days, um, we, we can then deploy these vaccines into a controlled context where we can both test the vaccines and hopefully use them to contain and control the epidemics. Thank you, Richard. And we'll, I'm sure, come back to you again with a little more on that. But um, you mentioned Ebola as really the precipitant for a wake-up call that we needed to do a lot of things differently. And we did do a lot of things differently. But, you know, Mark, you were at Merck at the time and one of the big champions of Merck getting on board with one of the three Ebola vaccine candidates. Um, why didn't we do it before and why did it take an outbreak um, to bring us to the table along with the rest of the industry? And how will CEPI help with that? Um, well, I mean, as Richard indicated, um, you know, while Ebola was uh, relatively well known as a disease, the expectation was that it could be managed just by uh, quarantine, you know, typical public health practices. And um, the need for a vaccine was, you know, maybe appreciated by people who were more concerned about, as Richard said, Ebola being a bioterrorist threat than they were thinking about Ebola being a major public health threat um, to the general um, community. So, but, you know, the world changes and uh, we're seeing that whether it's with plague or flu or other things, you know, you can't assume that everything is static and something you thought you understood is just going to stay the same. Um, that's clearly not the case. Um, you know, so it was very clear though when the Ebola outbreak happened in, in 2014 
And, um, you know, we ended up with over 20,000 cases of infection and around 12,000 deaths. But at the time, um, you know, mid-2014, there were projections by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that there would be over a million cases. So what happened at that time is many companies, you know, Merck, certainly uh, GSK, Janssen, a number of small biotechs mobilized to think about how they could um, contribute. And it was uh, really kind of a remarkable um, rising up, if you will, of different stakeholders of people really wanting to contribute. And from my perspective, I think it's a really good example of the goodwill that exists in, in the private sector about wanting to um, contribute to global health progress. But it also highlighted in many ways what the challenges are for private sector entities um, to do that. I think one of the good things about the Ebola response was just how many people came together to work on this. So the vaccine that Merck um, developed, just by way of example, was originally developed by um, investigators working at the Public Health Agency of Canada. It was licensed by a small biotech, New Link Genetics, when people were still thinking about uh, bioterrorist threats, um, but it languished. It didn't advance into the clinic with the Ebola outbreak. It was very clear that there wasn't a path forward for that vaccine to get developed in an expedited way. And um, Merck at the time was looking for opportunities about how the company could contribute. And you know, doing an Ebola vaccine program is like way off anyone's sort of plans for how you would prioritize um, activities, but it, it mobilized the company. It got tremendous support from the leadership of the company and Merck um, engaged in that program. But to describe it as a Merck program is um, not accurate because, in fact, when Merck licensed that vaccine um, towards the end of uh, 2014 in, in November, um, what happened between then and July of um, 2015 was that there were eight phase one studies, um, a large phase two study, and three phase three studies. Of those, only one of those studies was sponsored by Merck. All of them were sponsored by external investigators who Merck didn't really control. It was just people <laughs> collaborating and, and getting committed, but it was very clear that um, you can't keep doing that because a lot, in a lot of ways the private sector and the public sector need better ways of working together, but the public sector also needs a deeper appreciation of how to develop vaccines that lead to licensure. Um, what happened fortunately was that, that in that 10 month period from first in human studies in October to July, um, there was a phase three study done in Guinea that uh, showed that the vaccine was highly efficacious in preventing Ebola, which was a great um, uh, success, but it still, you know, highlights what can work, um, but what we need to do much better in. And I think CEPI is one example of that, but really um, we need to improve upon that because CEPI in itself is not going to be able to solve the problem. Yeah, so Mark, I, one of the things I love about you is you are so optimistic about so many things and you always see the glass half full. Um, I think some of us saw the glass a little bit emptier than did you. In today, I would say we've had three Ebola candidates and none of them are licensed. So as we look at uh, you know the next Ebola outbreak, we still don't have a licensed vaccine to be able to introduce um, to help solve a public health problem. So, you know, let's get real about that. And Rajiv, um, you've had to deal with that both in your government role, but you must be thinking about it also in your corporate role. Um, what is it that, that is in the way from good science to good solutions? Thanks, thanks, Julie. I, I, um, I wasn't that far behind you at UCSF. So <laughs> <laughs> One's there, a bus, always a bus. That's, that's, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> so uh, at Takeda, we, we have a government-funded program to develop a vaccine for Zika. And uh, we, we received that, that contract about one year ago, and we're close to our, our phase one clinical trials. And, and that has happened in a, a remarkable pace, I think, by, by any measure. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile to talk about decision-making in a company and what leads a company to make the kind of decision that Merck had made or 
that we have made in Zika and what gets in the way of making that affirmative decision because there are many things. And, and let me preface this by saying that if you want to develop a vaccine against any threat, you need industry. There have been many experiments by governments primarily, but NGOs as well, to develop vaccines in a different way with different models. It doesn't work. It doesn't work well. And it certainly isn't a model that you would want to rely upon to address an emergent pathogen where response time is critical. So industry is essential uh, to provide solutions as a partner. Now, for Takeda, when we made the decision to, uh, to work with BARDA or to apply to work with BARDA on Zika, we felt that we had relevant expertise. We have a dengue vaccine that's now in phase three. We have a lot of flavivirus experience in the company. And we also have a manufacturing platform that we felt was very agile and appropriate to address this and other threats in the future. And of course, we wanted to, to have an impact. Uh, in fact, if you look at our pipeline, everything that we're working on has the potential to have huge impact. Uh, there was this question about potential commercial, uh, about commercial potential, but that was an unknown. But, but there are a number of things that got in the way of a positive decision. The epidemiology of Zika at that time was uncertain, and we've all seen that the epi has gone down. There are very few cases now of microcephaly in Latin America. The market environment was uncertain. At the time that we entered, there were over 30 companies that had publicly disclosed that they were working on Zika vaccines. Once you bring a vaccine to market, you rely upon public health recommendations. There was no way to know whether authorities would recommend broad use of a vaccine against Zika or what type of vaccine or not. And if you're developing a vaccine and don't have a recommendation, you might as well not have a vaccine from a company standpoint. There are questions around pricing. There, there, there were so many uncertainties that, that it really made this enterprise infeasible for a company. On top of that, there is the opportunity cost. And this is something that is often missed by those who debate this issue when they say that, well, if we take out the R&D cost of developing a vaccine, then we should be able to get a vaccine at a very low price because you don't have to pay back the R&D. The R&D in sunk investment is just one part of the equation. Risk is another, but opportunity cost is, is a big one. When you take a large portion of your team and your facilities and you direct them to a product development program like Zika, you're taking them away from something else that may have a more certain return on the investment. This is the reality of what life is like in a company. And if you take a step back and go beyond vaccines, our, ours is a company that has programs in oncology and gastroenterology and central nervous system diseases. If you think about deployment of capital, there are a number of other more certain ways that you could deploy your capital than in an enterprise like Zika with all these uncertainties. Mm -hmm. And this part of the equation is not often discussed. And, and I think it's uncomfortable for people to talk about these things because they relate to private sector considerations. Well, I think you have to talk about these things if you want the private sector businesses to be a part of the solution. Now, the reason this worked for us ultimately is not only because we wanted to, to make a difference, but because the US government stepped in and said, we will cover your R&D costs, your internal costs and your external costs. The term that we use for that is de-risking. If this vaccine doesn't go anywhere after licensure, we can still feel that we did the right thing. And we can, we can go to the board, we can go to uh, stockholders and say that we, we did our best we wanted to make a difference. This was the right thing for the company to do. There isn't a market, but somebody else covered the R&D costs. You did not. And that, what, we, what I would call push investment, push incentive, makes all the difference for, at least for this company. And I think it's the case for many companies. But I will say that the dynamic in every company is different. And, and we need to have models for this kind of partnership that are flexible and can accommodate what a priority is for one company versus another. So in a sense, Richard, that's what CEPI is. It's, a, it's on, on the one hand trying to call out the best science and the best um, candidates for investment, but it's also an investment opportunity. And you might want to explain a little bit about where the money comes from and what the outlook is to scale that investment so that we can actually 
um, have an increased probability. We, we know, by the way, and I um, disclose that I am on the CEPI board, we know that um, the chances that the things we invest in first will be the source of the next outbreak are pretty slim. Um, so we recognize that we, we have to prepare people for the fact that the investments we're making might not cover the next emerging pathogen, but we're going to eventually get them in the freezer. But who's paying for all of that? So we, we've got a, a, a number of investors. We have both philanthropic investors, uh, the Gates Foundation and Welcome uh, have both made very substantial contributions of around $100 million each. Uh, we also have sovereign investors, and we have three large sovereigns, Norway, which has put in about $200 million, uh, Germany, uh, about $100 million, and Japan, about $125 million, and then other sovereign investors, Canada, Belgium, Australia. What's interesting, um, Julie, is that the where the investments come from with respect to the sovereign investors differs. And so we have the investment from Germany is coming out of their Ministry of Research and Education. The investment from Norway is coming out of its development agency. The investment from Canada is coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but through their security programs. And so you can imagine that the motivations of the investors differ. Um, I think I think Rajiv made a number of, of critically important points, and I've, I've been doing countermeasures for a decade or more, and, and, and I think his point about you don't have a solution if you don't have industry at the table is critical. And I also think the, the examples that have been cited, the Takeda example, the Merck example, companies have, have actually a long and very creditable record of doing the right thing when going back to the meningitis A outbreaks in, in the 1970s and to other outbreaks over, over time, the companies will always step up, but it is hugely disruptive for those companies to sort of do that from a cold start in the middle of a crisis. Mm -hmm. And so part of what CEPI is trying to do is, is recognizing that epidemics, you know, vaccines for epidemics or pandemics is, is not just an industry problem, it's a societal problem. And, and so we have to balance the the needs of our investors, which you know they're they have fiduciary obligations as many of them as stewards of public funds, with the very legitimate concerns and and um, trade offs that our industry partners have to make, and we have to find a way to balance those and balance the needs of civil society to ensure access to the products, um, and 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 so CEPI, in addition to being a a a funder. Of, of this research and providing the push incentive that Rajiv talked about. We also have a coordinating role and we have to sort of be a convener and bring people to the table and, and facilitate these conversations and mutual understanding because if, if you get into a dynamic where the funders just don't understand what the problem is with industry and why can't industry just come through, you know, that that's not a productive dialogue. And, and so that's another hat that CEPI wears. Thank you. I think we can uh, have some questions from the room if folks want to stand up and grab a microphone. We have microphones available. I don't even know that. <laughs> Great. Yes, over here. Um, a lot of the trials are conducted in pretty large sample numbers. Um, and at least coming from a genetics point of view, I believe a lot of the trials are conducted with a consent clause that says we will not sequence you, uh, will not collect too much data from the human subjects. And it seems like, just from a scientific point of view, it seems like a very big gold mine that we're not tapping into for feeding back into basic research, including um, studying you know, on the molecular level effectiveness or safety or just basic immune reaction to vaccines and the infections. Um, I was just wondering, am I right? And is there any changing thought or policies or practice in that area? Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, let me, let me start and, and maybe kick it over to Steve on, on more of the scientific issues. I, I, I think there, I mean, I mean, one thing that we understand is, is that the induction of immunity against these threat agents 
you know, differs by threat agent, whether whether you're going, I mean, and, and, and we don't necessarily have a, a great understanding of correlative, I mean, we, we definitely don't have great understanding of correlative immunity for the threat agents that we're talking about because they haven't been deeply studied. And so there there is a huge amount of translational science that could both inform vaccine design and uh, help us design better vaccines and better clinical trials. And the the... There will be clinical trials for these vaccines that are done. I'm going to euphemistically call it peacetime, you know, in a non-epidemic setting where, depending on where the trial is conducted, you may have more or less opportunity to perform these correlative studies that you want to do. Um, there also will be studies that are done likely in very austere environments, likely in environments that have fragile, if any, clinical trial infrastructure. And the you know, Mark can also perhaps speak to some of the challenges that were encountered in the clinical trials that were performed in West Africa during the Ebola epidemic. But Steve, I don't know if you wanted to talk about the science. Uh. I mean, as, as, as you conduct a clinical trial, I think it goes without saying, you can always do more. And you, you, you build your protocol around your, your clinical endpoints, and then someone will come along and say, you should have done this. And <laughs> why did you consent them for this? And you, you have to be you have to be fairly forward thinking. Yet you have to have a consent that people will enroll in the study. And we are, as a, a government agency, our clinical trials are a, a treasure trove of data and samples, and we we make those available as much as we can to the groups that have an interest in in mining this data and looking at these samples, as long as we've you know consented to that. But we can always do better, for sure. I, I, I just want to ask you, Steve and Mark, probably, and really, Rajiv, from your previous Bill and Melinda Gates role, you know, we do have to factor into this the cultural environment in which we're trying to do clinical research and how completely unfamiliar people are with research, for example, in West Africa, and how difficult it was from a sociologic perspective to, um, to move these 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 products forward, because I think that's part of what CEPI's trying to solve for. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, you know, just to give people a reality check, so the phase three study that yielded an efficacy <coughs> result for the Ebola vaccine was done in Guinea, and um, Guinea is a very impoverished country that suffered lots of societal disruption, mm -hmm. war, um, ethnic challenges, all kinds of things, and this was the country where a number of uh, healthcare workers were killed um, in the early days of the Ebola outbreak because populations were suspicious of what they were, were doing, and can you imagine doing a large-scale efficacy trial in that context, and it's kind of a miracle that it was possible, and that by far... While it's a miracle, it's, it's again, it's not the way to do it. What you need to do is be present in those places and build trust, build capacity, and have a long-term commitment. You can't just, you know, parachute in and say we're going to to save you. And as the world is thinking about the lessons learned from Ebola, it's not just in the vaccine development area. We recognize that you need um, capable healthcare systems in these countries, you need capable R&D capacities in these countries, and you need the sort of global connectivity to make all of this work, and you need a sustained commitment because otherwise you can have the best vaccine candidate or the best drug if you can't do the studies to demonstrate the efficacy or nowhere. Yeah, and I, I think uh, it's important as we move forward that we've got to move away from what Francis Collins calls the colonial model. Of, of rolling these things out and really empower, and he speaks specifically about West Africa, empower these West African countries so that they, instead of, they have an ownership rather than a donorship. Yeah. And that that's something that we think about all the time. It's okay to have a vaccine in your pocket or a vaccine candidate, but you've got to, it's much more than that. It's infrastructure, it's education. NIH has all kinds of programs for like the Medical Education Partnership Initiative, MEPI, and the um, Welcome Trust H3 Africa. Where we're trying to, to, to uh, educate and, and uh, develop 
these capabilities in Africa rather than bringing them to Africa. Yeah. That we say, why don't you bring 10 you know, entomologists to every country? And uh, as, as uh, uh, we would reply, why don't we grow 10 entomologists in every country? And that, that, that's a part of it. Just having the vaccine in your pocket is it's a Band-Aid right, rather than g giving you some ownership. Yeah. Mike with the microphone. <laughs> Uh, Mike Rosenblatt, I, first of all, I want to applaud all of you on the efforts. I think that they're really admirable. Um, I think I may see things a little bit differently. I think you're being forced to operate at a level that in, is not going to address the nature of the problem, given its magnitude and its potential pace. I would have not have said that the consciousness in America began with the Ebola outbreak. I would have said that it started on 9-11, the day after people were talking about bioterrorism. You'll remember that that was followed by an anthrax threat. And so here we are 16 years later. We don't have, that I know of, a list drawn up by a consortium of industry, government, professionals, in the field that says, look, here are the 25 things that we have to address. I appreciate that it's difficult to make vaccines and antivirals and to do the clinical trials, but 16 years later, our effort is really very small, and, and in fact, we've shown that we can make vaccines and we can do clinical trials with a considerable degree of success, maybe not for all of the whatever the number is, 25. I guess my question is, why hasn't the world looking at this as a national security threat? We, we can mobilize. We did it with the Manhattan Project, right? We said that was a national security <coughs> threat. And we took people out of academia. We didn't give them grants. We said, move to Los Alamos and address this thing. So why hasn't the world said, here are the 25 agents. The United States ought to tackle 15 of them. Europe ought to tackle 10. Japan ought to tackle five. We'll have all these things sitting on the shelf. Yeah. Why aren't we there yet? So Julie, we met someone who's more optimistic than me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take a crack at that. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, put my old US government head on. I was, I was, as Julie mentioned, the chief medical officer and deputy director at, at BARDA, which is the organization that was created to do exactly what you're proposing. And, and, and I will respectfully disagree. tell you disagree uh, and, and, and say that there is a canonical list for biodefense threats. And it's, it's jointly established by the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Secretary of Homeland Security. And that list has driven U.S. government investment for the better part of the last 15 years. And in fact, before I left BARDA, we had actually made a great deal of progress. We had, and these are these are for things like anthrax and smallpox and, and botulism, things that have no commercial market. And, and by the time I left BARDA, we had supported through public-private partnerships, through the provision of R&D funding, through procurements for stockpiles, uh, and through the provision of a lot of technical support, principally from NIAID um, and the Department of Defense to some extent, there, there were 23 products with no commercial markets that had achieved FDA licensure approval or clearance. And, and so we actually did figure out the model. The, 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 what you're proposing about dividing them up between the different countries, we actually tried that through something called the Global Health Security Initiative starting in 2002 with the idea that we would try to engage our partners in developing a global medical countermeasures enterprise. And the fact of the matter is that our partner countries, for lots of reasons, their own internal priorities, the smaller size of, of their national economies, just could not muster the critical mass to divide it up in the way that you were proposing, which is England, you take these five, Germany, you take these three. And, and so there really never was momentum for different countries to own and push projects to completion. That CEPI actually, interestingly, I think it's an important point. 
CEPI represents a different model for international collaboration, which is pooling of resources and, and, and achieving the critical mass to make progress through pooling of resources, which is not, for whatever reason, the U.S. government never really tried to approach it that way. So can I respectfully disagree with you and um, su support my fellow optimist? I mean, to me, um, I think we need to be able to do these things. I think we need to be able to prepare for the next pandemic. And I think this is a really important opportunity for us. And I just, you know, just want to recognize Dr. Vagelos's presence here and, and sort of think back on some of the things he did in his career. So, you know, Merck, had discovered a drug called ivermectin for veterinary purposes, and this drug was found to be curative for river blindness and an effective treatment as a component of combination therapy for lymphatic filariasis. When that drug was developed, Merck wanted to make it available to the world, to people who needed it, but there was no model to do that, so what was created was a public-private partnership that helped make that possible, and now billions of treatments later, that program continues. Merck gives that drug away for free, which is not a sustainable model. At the time, it was the only thing to do, but that's not going to get a company to engage in a similar program. Now, you know, similarly, there was a technology transfer of the hepatitis B vaccine to China prior to when Gavi was available to make vaccines available to low-income countries. But the world has changed, and that creates new opportunities. But the failures of recent history really, to Mike's point, make it necessary for us to think about how to do better. And to Rajiv's point about opportunity costs, I mean, there are realistic barriers for private sector engagement in this and for people to sort of like not take those on and figure out how to solve them. I mean, I'm really worried when, you know, the companies responded to Ebola and then the world walked away. The companies responded to Zika and the world is walking away. You shouldn't expect them to step up again. Yet, as Rajiv said, you know, we need them, and we need to figure out ways of having them engaged, not necessarily you know, so that they suffer the opportunity cost, but that they can provide their expertise and a deep understanding of how products actually get developed in a way that they can reach people in a sustainable um, manner. And I think that's something that needs to be solved. And whether it's individual companies having a much better idea about how to approach that strategically and the public sector learning how to do that, whether there's opportunities for sort of pre-competitive or non-competitive collaboration between different companies, we need to think about new models to get this done because to Julie's point, there's no shortage of challenges, but we're not going to get to Mike's vision unless we have a new model to get the work done. Can I just make one, one, one comment following on that? And, and Mike, I think it's a great point. I, I worked closely with Richard and, and Julie from the White House perch running biodefense for several years. And the reality is that the one bug, one drug approach that has driven biodefense efforts for a very long time, still does, out of necessity, will not set us up for success when we face the next unknown unknown. And so while one bug, one drug uh, vaccine works for certain things that are high potential threats, the low probability, high consequence threat that we have not yet seen requires a different approach. And the conclusion that we reached in the government at the time that I think still stands is that the establishment of platform technology, such as what Steve referenced, would go a long way toward getting to a level of preparedness that we need, where we can have a very short cycle time between recognition of the threat and an actual countermeasure that can be scaled up and taken into populations. You could, we could talk about this for a lot longer, but I think that that's, I think you're absolutely right that this is the responsibility of governments. And I can tell you that the U.S. government is way out ahead relative to any other government in thinking about this and, and working on it, although, of course, there, are, there is more that can be done. So what's that? What? So your, your, your Merck trial in Ebola was successful and a very interesting construction, a ring fence. So why don't we have a vaccine? Oh, I mean, what are the specific yeah. things that either the government or government and Merck need to do to have a vaccine? Because that disease hasn't gone away. No, People so are carrying it in their eyes. It's in a slow smolder. Yeah, okay. we could have a very long conversation about that, and it's one of the things that Richard is really struggling with. But um, yeah, having data are, are, are an important first step, but then there's the regulatory process and regulatory harmonization and uh, getting files accepted and the complexities of 
um, diagnostic testing and sample transport across border, and you, it goes on and on and on. So it's extremely challenging. We believe me, if it was easy, it would have been done. And the barrier we were learning a lot as we go through this process. You know, the FDA doesn't have a lot of experience with the file from Guinea. So adjudicating the reliability of the data and going back and filling in all the you know data fields, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is a, a very challenging situation. I think that's part of what, what we've learned in this context is, is going back to what Steve said. We have to create a, a research apparatus so that when we're done with this at the end of the day, we can take these phase 2B candidates and get them into phase 3 studies when we need them and hopefully end up with licensed products. But we, when the um, cases of Ebola emerged in the DRC, uh, we sat on the edge of our chairs worrying that there would need to be utilization of this unlicensed but available vaccine and even the process of what a country has to be able to do to import an IND product basically make it available the consent process in DRC I have absolutely no experience with that whatsoever so part of what we have to do it goes back to the delivery concept we have to prepare countries to receive research products and that's a very complicated bureaucratic process it's not straightforward I know you're, 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 Richard is spending a lot of time behind the scenes with work groups on, on this whole delivery challenge. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I won't uh, maybe get some more questions in, but it, but it is a systems challenge. It's not just a technical or a scientific problem. I mean, I mean that's the very first thing. And in, 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 actually, I don't think that Mark and I disagree, <laughs> but I, I will nuance it a little bit. And in, in, in a very important word that Mark said in his, in his remarks was sustainable. And the the challenge, if as you say, Ebola is not going away. These are threats in perpetuity. So technically succeeding and then having a product that drops off the market because it's not sustainable, it really is just you know doubling the tragedy. So, could I ask a follow up on Zika, hmm? where Rajiv and Takeda are working on it? Yeah. So, we don't really know a lot about the epidemiology and course of that disease. Just because we're not seeing a lot of microencephaly suddenly, we don't know about babies or mothers who've contracted it, what's going to be five years from now. Right. Is part of your mandate to also follow up epidemiologically on these outbreaks and learn something? So, no, it's it's not. But 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 with, res with respect to Zika, I think a really critical point about Zika is, you know, it, it, it was it was quite prominently Sanofi dropped its Zika vaccine program, which had been you know largely co-funded by the U.S. government, and they cited lack of U.S. government support. And there is a history of governments, which are driven by sort of annual budget cycles and current political events, you know, losing interest in epidemic diseases as soon as the epidemics are contained or go away, and that's a real problem. And it sends a terrible message to our private sector. Partners and one of the advantages that I hope CEPI can bring to the table. I've got five years of funding. I need to be very careful and selective about what I fund. But once I make a funding decision or decide to fund against a certain disease, I can at least say you've got five years of commitment. Uh, let me let me comment on that. One of the one of the problems with funding at NIAID is that for all of these. Uh, uh, vaccines, it's a zero-sum game. So Zika came along, where did we find the money immediately? We took it from Ebola. And Tony Fauci has, has advocated for an emergency fund for that purpose so that it's not a zero-sum game. You can't do it all in one fiscal year or on a five-year contract. And that, that's part of the problem is the sustainable funding. I think funding is the, the big elephant in the room we haven't talked about. but. I, Something's got to change, mm -hmm. and that needs to be Congress. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the uh, discussion that we're having sounds to me like a uh, administrative mess, and, and uh, very hard to get something done. Uh, <coughs> but I have not had the, some of the information that I expected. Do we have the knowledge and the ability to make a vaccine? Where are we with HIV vaccines today? 
And are, is it possible that we have that kind of problem with other vaccines that are in the so-called pipeline? Yeah. Where are we with, with HIV? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we don't have an HIV vaccine, um, and it's we could have a few hours of discussion about why that's the case. I think the main issue is the scientific challenge. You know, we don't know how to make vaccines against diseases for which natural immunity doesn't exist. And given that everyone who's ever been infected with HIV, with one exception that we know of, uh, had HIV for the rest of their lives, you know, clearly the immune system isn't uh, doing its job. Um, and we need to do better than natural immunity. But in a lot of ways, that's the challenge for many new vaccines. I mean, the ones that we have are tremendous, but in some ways, however hard they were to develop, they're easier to develop, they were easier to develop than the ones that we don't have but, but need. And, you know, I think what's happened, though, as we've sought an HIV vaccine and other mm -hmm. new vaccine technologies, such as the work that Steve does, the science of vaccinology is just so much more sophisticated. It is actually amazing. And the search for an HIV vaccine has actually contributed to driving scientific progress that is now being broadly applied to other vaccines. So we'll have other vaccines that were enabled by the search for an HIV vaccine before we have an HIV vaccine. There is a lot of progress in prevention, but this is, you know, I mean, I've been doing this, Julian, I've been doing this since the early 80s, and that's you know, kind of scary to, to think about. Um, <laughs> scary. But people are going to be doing it for a much longer period of time. But we have to sustain that effort because um, there is really, that's the only way we're going to end this epidemic. And I, I, and I just add, Roy, because I think, I, you know, I, there, there are a lot of exciting technologies and platforms that are in progress. Most of us in the field are working on them. But uh, at the end of the day, much of what needs to happen from health protection is not limited by the science of the vaccine. It's limited by all of the other things that we've been talking about. The three diseases I started with, there are candidate vaccines that would work and would be very helpful in protecting people. We just don't have them deployed. So, you know, what do you, the low-hanging fruit here is taking advantage of what we already know and getting it available. Um, as Rajiv pointed out, we need platforms, especially for the unknown threats, and that's an area that I think is still an active invest in investment going on um, from a government perspective, but also inside of industry. And that will speed up um, the first hurdle, but it's not going to solve the second, third, and fourth hurdles of actually getting something in the arms of the people who need it when they're exposed or threatened. I think we can just take one more question, and then we'll... Uh, actually, I will take that question back there, because you had your hand up before. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emma Van Hook from Pharma's Policy Department. Um, we've seen lots of proposals over the last year that might make some changes that um, might inadvertently decrease some of the incentives that innovative companies like Takeda and Merck have to enter into some of these novel research agreements um, related to licensing changes and things like that. Um, from a policy perspective, what are some of the things that you all have seen over the, the last year that um, make you a little bit nervous, that have pushed companies like Sanofi away from the table? And what can we be thinking about as novel incentives or programs that would help keep companies engaged and bring them to the table, given all the complexities and challenges in this space? Well, I would just, uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just say that <clears throat> The, uh, I, I think you're referring to uh, potential restrictions on pricing of, of uh, commodities once they reach the market. I do think this is an important consideration that needs to be discussed with companies in, in the course of, of these discussions. I think that there is a balance. I, you know, I, I like to think about the Gates Foundation approach to this problem, where they have global access agreements with any company they work with that allows the company to capture the value of innovation in non-low-income country markets. Uh, it, broadly speaking, that's what the Gates Foundation does. And, it, and so this concept of striking a balance where you support the company, de-risk the program, and ensure that the populations that you're targeting get access to the vaccine, whether it's through pricing or other, whatever else you have to do, but then allowing the company to capitalize on any uh, innovation that comes out of that for other products or in other markets. I think that is a that's an approach that I think has worked quite well, and I think that's something that the U.S. government could could consider. I think we have run out of time in our uh, panel. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you to the panel. Thank you.